I'm Sam Novi. I'm a uh, fellow at the SNF Agora Institute at uh, Johns Hopkins University. I've uh, been really excited to be uh, hosting uh, something uh, all, uh, all throughout 2022 called the 100% Democracy Festival, where we've been celebrating uh, bold ideas uh, moving America towards full participation. Uh, and today, if you learn nothing else during today's session, I want you to take away the fact that there is something that can be done in all 3,000 municipalities in America, in all 50 states, uh, to move America towards full participation. So no matter if you're in the most difficult uh, political environment in the uh, in the country, you know, where, where people are just trying to suppress votes left and right, or if your city council has already lowered the voting age to 16 and put an automatic voter registration, there is something more that you can do uh, to move America towards full participation. And you know, with everything going on in America right now, that is essential. We have to do all of the things that we have the power to do. There's no reason not to do those things just because we're sad about other, you know, the Supreme Court or whatever. So, um, so I'm just so excited about how many things are within our power to get done right now, um, and uh, uh, and and the number of people I'm meeting in communities all across America who are fired up about doing these things. And so I'm just really excited uh, for you guys to meet. Uh, Dr. Michelson and Ahmad and uh, Dr. Daniels later to just uh, you know learn more about what's what's going on. Um, one reason, one thing you're going to hear about later today that I'm really excited uh, about is uh, you know often we think about getting to 100% participation as being all about election administration, about making the rules uh, of voting uh, more accessible and more inclusive. But one thing that's coming out of a lot of the research uh, that, that's happening uh, with Dr. Michelson and um, uh, and Dr. Daniels and others is that, uh, you know, voting is uh, so much about culture. It's not just about the administration of the election. It's about how people feel on election day. And we have a lot of control without any permission from the government to change that. And there's all sorts of things that we can do with policy to change the culture of elections, even if we don't control election administration, even if we don't control the state laws. And so that's um, uh, what I want to talk about today, as well as some really exciting ways that we can change the state laws if, uh, if you're in a position to do that. Um, so without further ado, I want to give each of our panelists um, a second to uh, introduce themselves, um, and then I will get into the rest of our conversation. So Ma, do you want to introduce yourself uh, briefly? Uh, yes, and thanks, Sam. And I share Sam's enthusiasm that we can do something everywhere, in every community, in every city, in every neighborhood, to make sure democracy is thriving and working for everyone. Uh, my name is Amada Vera Wagner. Uh, I'm the current chief of staff for the mayor of Green Bay. I've worked for U.S. Senator Markey as a, uh, as a director of policy. I was a local elected official myself, born and raised on the East Coast in Springfield, Massachusetts, home of basketball, but a diehard uh, Packers fan my entire life, uh, and excited to be working with this incredible panel doing, doing and talking about incredible things. So thank you, Sam. Great, and uh, Dr. Daniels. All right, can you all hear and see me okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we're good, okay, <laughs> perfect. All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Ashley Daniels. I am currently the ACLS uh, fellow for a Black Girls Vote and working in tandem with the National Conference on Citizenship. Um, I've been working there for about a year and I am also the one of the lead strategists for um, a wonderful program called the Black Girls Vote Research Network, where we aim to bring together uh, community and scholars to cultivate solutions and discuss strategies uh, for Black communities and Black voters. And I'm excited to be here with you all today with you know some faces that I know and some faces that I do not know. So thank you. Great, and Dr. Michelson. And I'm Melissa Michelson. I'm a professor of political science and also Dean of Arts and Sciences at Menlo College out in California. And I've been doing get out the vote work since 2001, um, inspired my, by my friend Don Green. And the one thing I wanted to share was that, you know, I've mentioned this 100% democracy, 100% turnout phrase to a lot of folks. And they say, yeah, but is that like, that's just a fun thing to say, right? That's not actually possible. I'm like, no, no, it's actually possible. And we're going to get there. So uh, it's not just a fun slogan. It's a it's a realistic goal. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so I want to kick off our conversation. I want to ground our conversation today in some of the really exciting research. This is unpublished research. So you guys are getting some, like, 
inside soup about a new book that uh, Dr. Michael has been working on with Dr. Daniels and the whole Black Girls Vote team. And I've been trying to help where, where I can. And this is about the theory of voting as community celebration. I think this is really essential because I know what you're thinking. Like, 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 how is it possible that people in every community in the country could have control of really influential things about our voting culture and our voting, um, you know, are moving us towards 100 democracy? How, how is it possible that we have things that we can do that move that needle forward without controlling election administration, without controlling state laws? And so I want Dr. Mosley to share just a little bit of a preview of what's in this book and what the theory of voting and community celebration is all about um, uh, so that you get a sense of, uh, of why this is such an important what we're, what we're seeing in the research and why it's such an important opportunity for um, for policymakers all across the country. Thanks, Sam. So yeah, as Sam mentioned, this is a book that I'm working on with some other folks, and it's really all about Party at the Mailbox. And Party at the Mailbox is a program that was the brainchild of Nikidra Robinson from Black Girls Vote. And in June, in the spring of 2020, um, Black Girls Vote and Baltimore Votes, um, aka SAM, worked together with 60 other community organizations in Baltimore to bring a spirit of celebration to the all male primary of June 2020, right? So, you know, back uh, decades ago, elections used to be public and celebratory. Um, voting wasn't this private sedate event where you just sit at home and you fill out a ballot or you go into a little booth and you secretly make your choices. It was something that was done as a party. There was a lot of alcohol, but there was also really high voter participation, like 85% participation on a regular basis. Then as we move to making voting something more that people did in isolation and more sedately, turnout dropped dramatically. And so the whole idea of the precinct parties, which many of you are probably familiar with, was to bring the party atmosphere back to elections. And then Nike's idea in 2020 was, well, we can't do that because we're voting by mail. How do we bring that celebratory spirit to voters in their homes? And so Party at the Mailbox is just that. It's bringing the party to your house. It's a, a box of materials. It's informational materials, but it's also noisemakers and posters and balloons and coloring book and crayons for the kids. And it's bringing in community because people were encouraged to post stories about them opening their box on uh, Instagram or to put the posters on their doors or uh, on their cars. So just as many of you might remember, we were all walking around at the height of the isolation period of the pandemic, looking for teddy bears in people's windows, right? Um, because everyone was going for walks. Well, in Baltimore, when they're doing this pilot in June, 2020, people were also seeing all these party at the mailbox signs and all these signs saying, I love Baltimore, so I vote. And, you know, black girls vote. and and so even people who didn't get a box became part of the celebration. So my academic team conducted a randomized controlled trial and we showed that it's very effective and I'll give you some numbers in a second. But a really important part of our evaluation is also that we conducted interviews and focus groups with people in the community after the election. And so some people got a box, some people asked for a box but didn't get one. But regardless of whether they were in the treatment condition or the control condition, they all felt like they were part of the celebration, that voting was, was something fun that they were all doing together as a community, even when they were quarantining and isolating at home because of the pandemic. And it led to spectacular increases in voter turnout, particularly among low propensity voters. And we saw increases in voter turnout in that primary election of more than 12 percentage points among low propensity household members. So just uh, an enormous effect, right? Um, Nike likes to say it's not just a box, it's an experience, right? It wasn't just that some people got a box of some stuff and some information about voting. It was that the whole neighborhood was celebrating democracy. And it's not quite the same as this theme we've often seen in the black politics literature about voting as a duty, right? To honor ancestors and to honor the fight for the vote. It's 
it's this celebration of voting as something fun that we're doing together as a community that's very different but similar to related to voting as as a duty to ancestors um and so we've replicated the program uh, we did a bigger program in baltimore in november 2020 we've expanded to detroit philadelphia atlanta richmond uh, we're trying lots of lots of things right uh it's it's an ongoing project that we're continuing to to play with and learn more about but the core finding that generating the spirit of celebration can motivate huge increases in turnout is is solid um and you know hopefully the the book will be out soon i we got to finish writing it but uh that that's your your teaser of this amazing thing we're doing um bringing folks closer to 100 percent democracy incredible i just want to highlight how exciting this is for all the policymakers on this call because the you know making um making voting more public making voting celebratory making anything you know cities schools no matter all forms of government are making an experience happen in their city all the time you know we you know the mayor of boston creates a vibe in boston for saint patrick's day right by closing down streets and having a parade you know schools will have you know uh you know uh, uh, you know something for um uh, you know, Martin Luther King Day to create a certain, you know, vibe in the schools on Martin Luther, you know, around Martin Luther King Day as a, as a day of service and so on. So there's all, the government is creating a vibe and energy in the city uh, all the time around all sorts of events. There's no reason that we can't be pulling all sorts of policy levers, uh, and not the policy levers, the levers in election administration, but policy levers in parts of government that are that are related to culture and, and the experience of the city. So this is just really exciting research that totally creates a whole new uh, you know, playing field for, for democracy policy. And I'm just so excited for this book to come out. So I now want to transition to Dr. Daniels, who is, um, you know, in order to generate these insights about uh, how we make voting more celebratory, how we create 100% democracy, we need to be learning differently together with academia and, uh, and, um, uh, and community-based organizations and government. And so Dr. Daniels is doing some really exciting work to convene uh, different different uh, folks and, uh, and and develop new knowledge. I want her to share a little bit about what, what she's doing before we get to the kind of the, the brass tacks of what you guys can do back in your communities after this uh, this uh, summer. Absolutely. So thank you so much, you know, for the introduction, Sam. And, you know, again, it's just really exciting to be here. So ultimately, uh, my role with working with Black Girls Vote for over the past year um, has been to work on what we like to call the Black Girls Vote Research Network. And it really is like a triangulation of sorts of Black Girls Vote's vision, uh, my personal experience, and also just the need in academia and both, you know, community. So, um, Quick story. So when um, I first came to, you know, Black Girls Vote um, as the ACLS fellow, uh, Black Girls Vote had this vision ultimately on how we can better support research um, on on Black voters, specifically Black women um, between the ages of, 25, of 18 to 25. And then also how can we support, you know, the research that goes along with that. Uh, so during my interview, actually, um, it was asked, well, we have this idea for this research network. You know, do you have some ways that, you, you know, we think we could do this? And uh, prior to that, um, um, I worked uh, during my PhD when I was uh, getting it from Howard University. I also worked at a nonprofit uh, that was focused on, you know, supporting uh, Black women. And so we were interacting with Black women, with hundreds of thousands of Black women, you know, across the country. And during my time there, um, it really was, you know, being in both spaces of both academia and the community space, uh, where it was a question of, where I would all, often, you know, think of ideas like, gosh, you know, I wish, you know, an academic was here to hear what the community members are saying. On the flip side of that, it was also, gosh, I wish somebody from the community was here to hear what academics are saying. So when we came up with this idea of um, the Black Girls Whole Research Network, that really was, you know, just a bridging of those two worlds. Um, I'm very proud to say that um, in a couple of weeks, actually, we'll be hosting our first uh, forum where we're bringing together uh, Black women researchers who study, you know, not just politics, but they also study like, you know, Black women in sociology, food justice, like, you know, all kinds of, you know, different disciplines, along with um, academic research, with along with community members who, who do that kind of work. And that whole um, 
idea or the platform is that we want to actually start a conversation amongst them so that we're they're talking to each other and cultivating solutions. Uh, soon after that, we will also be releasing uh, subgrants uh, to to kind of foster these relationships between these community scholar teams. You know, one of the things that we're um, that we're saying in the space is that you know everybody is a is a scholar, everybody is an expert. So whether you're an expert in the community, you're also an expert in academia. Let's you know come to, come together and you know be experts together. So we're really excited to see um, what kind of data and what kind of uh, conversations can come from these you know teams. Uh, we're you know very grateful to receive a grant from the um, American Political Science Association uh, to actually help host this along with our partners at Menlo College, at Johns Hopkins University, and uh, No Boundaries Coalition, you know, working with us, you know, to create this event. So yeah, we're really just excited um, to, you know, really just foster new knowledge, you know, to bring um, everybody together to have these conversations and hopefully, you know, gaining more knowledge uh, to support causes like 100% democracy and student voting and things of that nature. Incredible. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Daniels. Um, uh, so I wanted to just, uh, you know, recognize one of the questions that came in the, the chat about, you know, the um, drop boxes in uh, Wisconsin. And so, you know, the fights about the rules and the lawsuit, you know, all people, you know, fighting for rights, that stuff is so important. And we, you know, I, I cannot say enough how, uh, how much I am, you know, we're all so supportive of that work to, to protect voting rights. But there's this whole other lane that I think we're trying to talk about on this in this panel, which is about, so given the rules that we have, which are imperfect, right, what are the things that are entirely within our control at the local level, even at the community level, right, or at the institutional level, within your own school, within your own college, um, within your own nonprofit organization, where you can, you can change policy right now and, and start building a culture where everyone is included. And so I think the, the type of uh, theoretical uh, and uh, you know experimental work happening in uh, Dr. Maxson's book, and then the um, the work uh, Dr. Daniels is doing to convene different stakeholders to have a more strategic uh, conversation about how to build that kind of inclusive culture. That's going to make a huge difference in terms of being effective, because we can you know if we build the, the smoothest running voting system in the country with you know great drop boxes everywhere, there's still a lot of people who aren't going to turn up for it, and we see that in some of these uh, you know in states that have good policies. There's still a lot of people. Uh, not showing up. Um, and we also see that when there, even when there's bad policies, when people feel included, when they feel motivated, they do show up, right? And so, yeah, listen, obviously, you know, we can't out-organize voter suppression. That's, you know, it's a both-and type of thing. But but there's this huge opportunity around um, how we show up in our own communities and, and how we do that in the smartest, most research-backed and, and community-backed way. And that's what we're trying to, to, to get at this call. So I now want to turn this over to... Uh, the uh, legendary Ahmad Rivera Wagner uh, from the city of Green Bay, who, you know, talk about pulling every lever that can be pulled at the local level. Um, that is what Ahmad is doing. So, Ahmad, why don't you tell us a little bit about just the incredible work you're doing uh, in Green Bay and uh, with cities across Wisconsin. Uh, thank you, Sam. And I just want to be thankful to be on a panel with such brilliant and thoughtful people who are trying to figure out the best ways to ensure that people's voice can be heard, whether it's uh, through the voting process or being involved in their community is just refreshing to hear the thoughtful and innovative ways that people are working. Some of you may have heard of Green Bay, Wisconsin, uh, both from our amazing football team to some of the wild notions about conspiracy theories that exist in our world right now. But one of the things I'm incredibly proud of is that during the 2020 election, we had 89% of eligible voters turn out. Uh, and one of the things that we saw in this community, uh, even though we were in the midst of a pandemic, um, and partly because of some of the genius work of Mr. Novi uh, and some of the work at the panel, we really wanted to make uh, voting something that mattered to folks uh, at this time. Even though there was a culture in Wisconsin of that our elections matter and things of that nature, and people can talk about that all the time, but there were still uh, folks who didn't necessarily feel like their voices mattered or they were included or they understood. And one of the things that we really wanted to do is create a, a culture of inclusion that your voice not only matters, but it matters that you're involved not only in your presidential elections, uh, but your municipal ones and things of that nature and watching and dealing with the gap in between those two things. And so one of the things that we took on um, as people were dealing with the, the pandemic that we're really proud of here is Election Hero Day. Uh, I'm really taking the time and space to create celebration and support for the people who help make the micro units of democracy work at every level. And despite the wild and uh, threats that folks are feeling, folks being a part of their system and part of the democracy, whether they're 
casting a ballot or helping people figure out how to cast ballots really makes a difference in how people feel about their elections. And despite all of the misinformation and challenges that we're seeing, one of the most powerful things that we have here is that by having so many people involved in our poll worker program and making sure that people feel like they are uh, celebrated and honored is that despite those fights and misinformation here locally, the, we are finding local residents aren't being as bought into that misinformation and those divisive politics. They actually believe that their vote counted, that the election worked and that they're defending it because we, they believe like we believe that uh, everyone who's involved in the system deserves to be involved in the system and they saw how it worked and how it functioned and therefore want to encourage others and what's happening to folks. So we are really, really excited about the idea, not only uh, honoring and recognizing people, that kind of honor and recognition actually brought new players uh, literally and figuratively to the table. So the Packers have offered uh, in many ways, not only to serve as a voting site when we were having voting sites being closed down, they're so interested from that positive experience of working with poll workers that they're not helping in municipal and local elections to recruit poll workers, uh, give goodie bags uh, to people who participate, and they're open to even being an early vote location, something that we haven't had uh, in uh, Green Bay, Wisconsin, all because we created a positive, affirmative culture that being involved makes and ma makes a difference and makes a difference not only to people who are in this moment, but people who want to be in involved in making it 100% democracy for everyone. So I'm very thankful to all the research and work that's been done, but particularly Sam, who helped us create even a customizable poster uh, that uh, allowed for people to get not only awards, but they also got to say like, oh, I'm uh, my vote counts, my green vote, Green Bay vote counts, and how making that personalized here, that like even here in Green Bay, Wisconsin, we can feel like our vote doesn't matter, uh, but we got to 89% and our dream is to get to 100% uh, of eligible voters uh, and really move in that direction. So I'm just thankful that people are thinking at the most micro level of democracy, that's very easy to get lost into the presidential congressional horse racing, but where the rubber meets the road, where, where we're seeing the most affront of democracy uh, isn't necessarily uh, in Washington, D.C. It's in the places uh, that you can, it's the main streets, not the Capitol Hills. And how do we ensure that people know what's going on, they feel involved and celebrated, and that they feel like their voice is going to be heard, regardless of the misinformation and challenges that we see. So thank you to everyone here and excited about doing more work in collaboration with others to think of smart innovations that local governments can do uh, that are simple and nonpartisan, but are, that are about uplifting and supporting people as they decide the future of their country, their communities, uh, and their streets. Incredible. So I want to just elevate a couple of things about what Ahmad is saying here. They're so important. So, you know, Ahmad's in a, you know, he, he's being uh, uh, modest about it here, but he's in a really tough spot in Green Bay. You know, they, 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 there, there are um, you know, threats coming all the time, conspiracy theories about, you know, Ahmad personally in some cases, um, you know, uh, um, unfriendly legislature, unfriendly um, Supreme Court. And, you know, th those things all are going on in the background. And the question is, well, what are we going to do in the here and now? How are we going to show up every single day, even in in the face of, of those challenges? I think I'm so inspired, by the way, Ahmad and his team have found ways to, to take back agency, um, even in that tough context, to always be making every single choice that they can make um, to make a more inclusive democracy every single day, um, and uh, uh, and eventually, you know, I, you know, I believe that that builds power over time. And so, even if in the moment, you know, having a great election here day celebration doesn't change what's happening at the Supreme Court level, I think if we have the discipline as a movement to make those choices every single day about the things we can control in our schools, in our governments, in our communities, eventually we will build, build the power to change those things at a structural level. Um, so, yeah, but can I give a perfect sure. example of how that worked for us here locally? Sure. Yeah. Um, just as a really interesting moment, uh, we, as you, as Sam mentioned, we've had poll workers threatened. Our clerk threatened she's a woman of color, the first woman of color ever to hold a position. We've had the mayor's family threatened, uh, all because of the amount of people that voted in 2020. Uh, and so we ended up having some very conservative, or we call conservative. We ended up having some very interesting folks who wanted to eliminate our early absentee voting period in the city. They actually wanted to get rid of it completely. And over a hundred and near 150 people showed up who had been poll workers, who had been put our, put our, a part of Election Hero Day, that were across political ideologies, they were professors, they were activists, they were everyday people, they were people who were young 
um, there were people who are young at heart, showed up and stayed at a meeting till one o'clock in the morning to ensure not only did we not eliminate early in absentee voting, we actually expanded it to Sunday for the first time in their history of Wisconsin under some of the most difficult circumstances in the country in Green Bay, which is a bullseye for chaos and conspiracy theories. Uh, we were able to actually expand the opportunities for people to participate and it all stems back to building a culture since 2020, uh, since this mayor's administration came into place, where being involved, being celebrated for being involved and taking a positive stances that brings everyone together, people we, we don't even agree with. And we ended up taking a council that does not agree with this direction and it flipped 11-1 in favor of having not only what we have for early vote, but expanding it to Sundays for the first time in history for in perpetuity, um, because we built a pathway for people focused on this idea that 100% democracy matters, that celebrating that it matters, that getting involved matters, and that that involvement may start at this point, but has no off ramp, but has lots of on ramps. And so I'm really excited about not only taking what you all taught us and brought to the table and Sam's amazing create, creative energy and brought that together to do something that felt impossible literally a year ago uh, and now we are we are one of the few communities that actually has sunday voting uh in the city of green bay so uh, i'm forever thankful for the pioneers in this field and then one last note that i really love that you all mentioned is that you know i love that we're raising up uh, these ideas of celebration around voting for a lot of communities of color this has always been a central tenet of this. I'm Black and Puerto Rican, uh, and we see this particularly in Latino cultures, things from caravanas to other types of celebrations, and this idea that we are mainstreaming the idea that we can both celebrate, enjoy, have tough conversations, but also promote our democracy is something that we can do without uh, fissure and conspiracy theory, that we can actually do this in collaboration and celebration. I'm just really thankful that that's becoming a mainstream notion, and we're seeing the positive effects of that. Thank you, Sam. Incredible, incredible. So I want to close with a, a quick, important announcement uh, about an exciting opportunity in our space because Ahmad, you know, as, as, as you're hearing in Ahmad's story, like, there are things that feel impossible, like things that just don't feel possible in, um, in American politics right now that actually are possible. If we just decide they're possible and, and act like they're possible and celebrate the people at the local level who think they're possible, they become possible. We decide what's possible and what's not possible. And so one of my heroes in this uh, work is, uh, is somebody named Miles Rappaport, uh, who has been working for several years now on um, the idea that we should have universal civic duty voting in the United States. For those of you who aren't familiar with this, this is something that happens all over the world. This is normal in, you know, Australia, Brazil. I, I can't even list all the countries on top of my head right now. But there's, it's, there's just so many countries where like 95% of people vote, and educated people and less well educated people they vote at the same rate, and young people and old people vote at the same rate. It's just normal and they have you know in australia they have this thing called democracy sausage where everybody comes out and votes and they have a cookout of the, all the polling places and it's just amazing and so miles uh wrote this incredible book that you should absolutely read called 100 Percent democracy with ej dion um and his uh, his research assistant and um uh and he is starting a new organization called the 100 Percent democracy initiative that's going to be helping um uh, cities and, and municipalities that want to uh, take this uh, movement forward to imp implement universal civic duty voting in the United States for the first time. So if you are interested in that cutting edge uh, dream, uh, please reach out as well. And if, if you're just interested in doing something, in, you, know, you know, having an election hero day declaration in your community, hosting parties at the polls in your community, in your city buildings or, or at the schools, if you're running for school board, please reach out to me. I, we will help you find the right policy that's the right fit for your community. Uh, with that, we're right at 430. I actually... Uh, it is primary election day here in Maryland, and I'm about to go to the party at the polls in my neighborhood. Uh, so it has been such a uh, pleasure uh, to be on this with you all today, and I just cannot wait to uh, keep building 100% democracy with this network. We are going to get there in this country, in this lifetime, uh, thanks to uh, all of y'all's uh, belief and spirit and, and uh, community. So uh, thanks, Dr. Mike, and thanks, Ahmad, and let's, uh, let's go make it all happen together.